And it, that, that zest he had was, it would get everyone else going. Right, come on, let's go, we'll do this. He's that one, he's a, he's a main instigator of everything. They had such great laughs, you know, you'd have a typical bacon butty humour on the football or the weather or a laugh and a joke. And If I said, oh, do like, you fancy going to such and such place? He'd think about it, yeah, come on, let's go. He was one for never letting the grass go under his feet, he always wanted to be doing something. You know, if it's a weekend or an evening, he wanted to do something. Every, every day, there's not a... Miss him every day. Roger Mayman was born in October 1958 in Notend in Lancashire. Adrian was already 15 months old when his little brother came along. They grew up in the flat above the family hardware shop. We were just like best mates most of the time, but because we were so close together, no way we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, like I say we didn't fall out. We that's Roger's cat. <laughs> She's currently living with me. I got to know Roger's story when I was sent the Gazette newspaper article about Roger dying through throat cancer. The story behind it was he went to see someone in February, a dentist, because he had a little bit of a, a lesion in his mouth, a little bit of an ulcer in his mouth, so he went to see the dentist. The dentist done what they should always do, and that send a two-week referral. And when you read the rest of the article, he never really got to see the someone until the September. And by the time he'd seen someone in September, that little ulcer had grown so big it was coming out of the mouth and he got given six weeks to live. In addition to the many photographs, Roger's family also allowed us access to his personal diary. Here we pick up extracts from Tuesday the 15th of September 2020. Following the disappointment of my visit for surgery on Monday the 7th, a day I had long hoped and prayed for when finally this damn cyst was to be removed and things could start to improve for me after what had been three or four months of discomfort, lack of sleep and food. Okay, another delay, but what's another week after I've been so royally fucked about? Tuesday morning, lovely sunny day, a day to be glad to be alive. Aidy picked me and Lisa up, 1.30 for 2.30 appointment. Feels too good a day for bad news, but to be honest, there's always been a worry and doubt in my mind. Walking into a room with the five consultants in, all looking sombre, was quite daunting, and I knew the outcome by the look on their faces. Inoperable, no cure, no treatment. I knew it, and to be honest, I was expecting it. Still, to be told, killed me. Nothing, even to make me comfortable, could be done. With the outcome sinking in whilst walking to meet AD at the car, felt like shit. Quickly, on our way for a silent drive home, too much to take in. AD too upset to talk. It was early in February 2020, that Roger went to see his dentist for what he thought was a cyst. They took an x-ray and referred Roger to Blackpool Victoria Hospital for a panoramic x-ray. He attended on the 19th of February for the x-ray and waited to hear for the results and what treatment he would need. When he failed to receive any further appointment, he tried to contact the dentist only to find the practice was temporarily closed. But he seemed to be the sort of guy that had a zest for life and enjoyed being out with the lads. Yeah, we used to go out in his dad's van, take the van on a Sunday, and we all used to go to the lakes and we used to go all over in the van. We hired another van, we went down to Torquay, we put two bed mattresses in the back and off we went. And that was about ten of us slept in a van. For, for happening, you know, he's always saying, oh, come, come down, come down to Waterloo. And when there's loads of bands on, I said, yeah, we'll come down on that. But often we'd already arranged to do something else when he said, when he said to me, so we'd already got tickets for something else. So. He was a keen cyclist. I used to take him in the van to Manchester, to the Manchester to Blackpool bike ride. After a restless night, I start messaging people I've been working for the sad news. Try to take in food, well, smoothies. The growth in my mouth is a major obstacle to eating, drinking and talking. 
would be happy if that could have been taken out. Great to see my friends, but it does upset me knowing it shouldn't take a death sentence to get my friends together. To all of my friends, see more of each other. 4.30am. I have known the tumour in my mouth is growing alarmingly. Not much gap left to swallow, taking in foods. Don't know what the outcome will be when it closes completely. I guess the answer is drips. Do not fancy that at all. It was in mid-June that Roger noticed the cyst was growing and causing more discomfort. So he got a follow-up dentist appointment. The dentist was concerned and arranged for an emergency appointment at Blackpool Victoria Hospital for the 3rd of August. At this consultation, no further tests were either carried out or arranged, despite the fact that the cyst was now making it difficult for Roger to eat. The x-rays were by now nearly six months old. Roger was advised that he would be contacted within two weeks for treatment of the cyst. He didn't receive an appointment. Now six months since his first dental visit, he repeatedly contacted the Max Facial Department at Blackpool and he was eventually advised by a secretary that they were not currently doing any surgery and to stop contacting them. I believe football was a big part of his life. Oh God, yeah, he's my Blackpool fan, yeah, absolutely. Never, I don't think he ever missed a match. Blackpool football club through and through, thick and thin. He seemed to me a guy that loved his holidays. His dad was going to the Philippines for a month and uh, I just met up to, happened to mention it to him. And I said, look, I said, I'm going on my own. I said, I'm going for a break. So I'm going to travel around the islands. And he went, oh, yeah? Yeah. I said, well, why don't you come with me if you want? Two, right. But the flights, we're going. I'm taking a holiday in Far East. I'm going, you are. We're busy with work as well. I want to go. I want a long holiday. And off he went, you know. And that's how quick he make a decision on things like that. Because it... and. It was the best thing he ever did because it totally changed his life and it would have been a fantastic future for him as well. Sort of looking back now, I'm glad that he took that holiday, you know. I think uh, like Roger and I were both talking, going to set himself up for retirement. I think he was probably going to have more of these holidays than he'd had previously, you know, where we might have, you know, to enjoy life more. That was the sad thing really about him going. All the time to go, it was right at the end of his working life. So what sort of work do you both do? Well, we're both um, heating and plumbing engineers with the emphasis on the heating and gas. And it, but he had all that experience and all that knowledge. You know, it was a whole lifetime building that up, you know. He was just so committed to, to his work. He's a hard, crafting guy. Everything he did, he grafted. I think it's a family thing. It's you know if it's, if it's work you need doing, we just get on and do it. Um, especially especially if it's work work because my mum and dad started worked in their own business, so you know there's a tremendous work ethic within my family. You know, I used to do daft things on Monday morning. You go to a job, see so you've got no socks on. What do you mean? You've no socks on? Oh, well, I dried them all up. You have. You can't go to work without <laughs> socks on. <laughs> well, he was quite a determined guy. He always wanted to make money. Um, used to be about 15 of us in his dad's transit van, all just led in the back, swaying about all over the place. He used to charge for petrol and, and everything else, but he used to get it off his dad for free anyway. Uh, and then he used to make loads of sandwiches and sell them to everyone else as well and make money out of that as well. <laughs> I know I'm knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. If only I lived in Canada euthanasia would be an option at least. Gonna get everything sorted this weekend and go. I can understand being kept alive if you are going to get better. No stopping this tumour in my mouth. It's nearly filled it. Little pain, but it's uncomfortable. I can't carry on with this and don't know the answer. Bet the nurses haven't a clue what to do about mouth Maybe my knowledge gained during my work as a gas fitter may offer a way out. Carbon monoxide. Not feeling too happy today. After being passed from pillar to post, Roger went to the A&E department at Preston. 
he received an appointment for the 7th of September for what he hoped would be the removal of the cyst. Unfortunately, due to its growth, Roger needed further tests to be carried out so they could consider his treatment options. Roger went back on the 15th of September for the results of the tests, only to be given the devastating news that his condition was now untreatable. He was given six weeks to live. When did you get to know about the issues he was having? It was one of those things you're talking about, football results, and he goes, oh, by the way, I want to have something to eat on Sunday. And I bit into something, and I've got this boil, this lump in the back of me, back of my jaw. He said, I booked a dentist, and he gone to the dentist, and they thought it was a cyst. So he'd been to the dentist, and they'd referred him to have x-rays, and he went to the hospital, and they wouldn't see him. And this went on for a good few weeks, and he kept going back and asking for help. And that, that just started getting bigger, and the smell from his mouth, that type of thing. Started to lose a little bit of weight. He said, I can't eat properly, because this, this cyst, it's now growing over my teeth. That's pretty bad, that, Roger. You know, you need to get this sorted out, really. I was annoyed him as well for not telling us it, it had got, it had started getting worse. Would have got him to see someone private. Just to, just to move it along. If you just kick-start the treatment, it could have happened. So what we did, because we got nowhere with the local hospital, we took him to Preston. Preston Saturday morning in the van. We both had work clothes on. This abscess just got bigger and bigger and bigger. One of the nurses had got, in, uh, got, got to have a look at him. He knew from the way she reacted that there was something more than... They cyst. Then they got diagnosed, diagnosed with, with the cancer. Said you've got six weeks to live. That's it. You won't live before Christmas. You'll be dead. It was just devastated. It's made me very angry and bitter towards it because they wouldn't see him. I couldn't talk initially. Because I was driving back from picking him up and... Uh... I was just too upset, and I think Roger touched on that in the in the voice, didn't you? Because it's just a bombshell. Because when I saw him in Ju in June, um, he didn't seem concerned about it. I said, "Oh, I'm just waiting to go back." He was absolutely really down. He kept begging for help, and they kept refusing to see him because due to COVID restrictions, this sort of thing. But the dentist did the right thing, referring him to the hospital, and he was crying out for help. And nobody helped him. So, I mean, with Roger, I think it was great that the dentist picked it up. I think it's great that the dentist referred him on in a timely fashion, which is exactly what you'd expect. Then really you do expect within our health service to, to take on those next steps from there. Um, and, and hopefully, from Roger's point of view, would have been treated and, and taken care of. Mike Heffman collaborates with the Swallows an awful lot and he's a friend of the Swallows. I wanted him to point out the importance of going to see your dentist and your GP if you have any of those symptoms. In many ways, waiting at home when you're concerned about a problem means that you just actually fester on it. And I normally say to my patients when they're cleaning their mouth, just look in the mirror, see what you're doing. And while you're, you've got that mirror in front of you, take the opportunity to have a look inside your mouth, have a look underneath your tongue, uh, have a look at the side of your tongue, pull your cheeks out on either side and just have a look and see if there's any lumps that just look odd that you haven't noticed before, anything that's not getting better. Uh, and don't wait on it, do come along. So, have been for drinks. See if I can still squirt water into my mouth. Problem. The growth has filled my mouth. I can get fluid into front of my mouth, but it seems blocked from my palate, so can't swallow or take on board fluids. If that's the case, I'm clearly fucked. This cancer denies you your dignity. My question, what next? Well, next to no sleep at all, the night drags on and on. Slightly worrying this morning, nasal airways seem slightly blocked breathing difficult this morning. This was the last entry Roger made in his diary. 
In the final days, he lost his speech and was reduced to communicating through notebooks. His speech was going because the tumour was that big he couldn't talk. So he just he just wrote down on, on notepads. Like a book here, a book there, you know, just so he could just pick something up and write it down. And obviously it's just like random uh, notes he jotted down. Uh, I actually said to him when he got worse, I said, I will, I'll take you to Switzerland and go to that place in Switzerland. I said, I'll drive you there. Uh, but, you know, he was too ill to, to travel, really. I mean, I can still see him. Uh, the last night he was in bed. You know, just like he's, um, he jumped up like on his knees with the the sheet over him, and like you know, just, just shouting or like kind of you know, in frustration and anger. And it was just after then that we got the nurses to come round and give him something to help him sleep, and he never woke up after that. At around the same time of Roger's death. Chris Curtis and the Swallows had been collaborating with DataCan, the UK's health data research hub for cancer. Their findings were startling. Seven out of ten people were not getting referred to specialist cancer services. Four out of ten patients were not receiving their chemotherapy as they should. There could be between over 7,000 and almost 18,000 excess cancer deaths due to the direct or indirect effects of COVID. Just under 6 out of 10 people at risk of developing head and neck cancer are either not seeing a GP or not being referred to specialist cancer services with suspicious symptoms. Looking at a projected 5 year survival, this number drops by approximately 4%. Getting back to normal isn't good enough. The current data suggests we may need to be operating at 130% of pre-COVID levels in order to address the backlog, the missing diagnoses and the delayed treatment for people with cancer. It's not a dig at the NHS. I don't want this to come across that we're having a go at the NHS. It's not. What I want them all to do is realise the importance of this as a campaign and let's look at change going forward and make sure all these people can get in when they get referred you got to take things seriously. But well, if something's there and it's not right, and you're not sure what it is, you've got to go and get some help. You've got to get in there and, and, and tell them that you're worried. Isn't it? Don't be knocked back. Keep fighting forward. Keep fighting until you get a proper answer. And don't be put back. Stamp your feet, do whatever you have to do, and insist on it being seen by the specialist. And don't go away anywhere until you've been seen is no longer just one of those stats that you see up on your TV that's died. And what I wanted to do is make sure those stats just don't get forgotten about. And Roger's family's allowed me to do that.